Good afternoon and welcome to the 28th annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technology. We've been here for ages discussing uh, the innovations. It's also been a waiting game. We've all been interested in when this commercialization process will be fully achieved and we'll start to see products um, everywhere uh, changing the atmosphere we live in. Uh, we're going to be talking about this topic with Dr. Dirk Berkland, uh, Business Development Hydrogen at Hudik International. And uh, the topic is uh, HIDEC open to new technology for a CO2 free environment. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Dirk uh, Berkland. Thank you, Rupa. So, the, um, uh, for those, uh, many of us, because technology is sometimes concealed within other products, uh, we don't know enough about the history of HIDEC. Uh, could you tell us about the company size, the history, and what you people do? Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, <clears throat> thanks for inviting me to the panel discussion. Um, so, HIDEC is a family-owned uh, company, and uh, HIDEC was found in 1963 uh, in the beautiful Sulzbach. Um, it's a little city close to the uh, French and Luxembourg border. border. And we are a family-owned company. And originally, we are a hydraulic, hydraulic company. So depending on which founder you're um, asking, he will say, OK, the name Hydac stands for hydraulic accumulators or hydraulic accessories. And today, we really are a full liner for hydraulic component, components, so it means from uh, accumulator, uh, wells, or hydraulic power units. Um, we can deliver everything on the demands, on customer-specific uh, demands of our customers. And today, uh, more than 1,000 people worldwide in different production, sales, and development facilities um, are working on these uh, products. So it's always fascinating when we talk to large companies. When I go back 10 years, everyone in the fuel cell business was, you know, 10 engineers here, five engineers there. It was all R&D and small. And to this day, the fuel cell manufacturers are not among the larger businesses. Uh, what we need, though, is uh, the luxury of not having to reinvent the wheel to develop every aspect of a fuel cell from scratch uh, all of the blowers and other technologies we need. Uh, so my company is, my question is always when large companies, and you do have a large company, um, uh, have these core expertise, um, uh, they have something to offer the fuel cell industry that the fuel cell cannot afford to develop on its own. Could you talk a bit about what HIDEC specifically offers, their core competence, before the fuel cell industry that was just ready and waiting for the fuel cell industry to ask for? Yeah. So I, our hydrogen uh, journey starts maybe 20 years ago out of a hydraulic uh, research project. Um, we started a research project to investigate uh, zero uh, kilometers of failures on hydraulic power units and uh, these hydraulic power units uh, fought out without, uh, without uh, having any uh, minutes of uh, proceed because uh, during pro the production process a lot of uh, swarf uh, remains in the component itself and uh, these swarfs are not very critical in the component but when the component is uh, assembled to a subsystem or a system itself, and uh, the, the system is proceed with high uh, volume flows and uh, high pressures, then uh, these swarfs or pollutions, particles, <coughs> um, can block very neurologic uh, points in the systems like uh, valves and sensors, and then failures occur. Mm -hmm. And in these research projects, we have developed methods and technologies to remove these particulars out of the hydraulic power units. And based on this topic, um, technical cleanliness, we have received uh, inquiry by Daimler-Benz uh, 
around about 2011 to develop a device which enables Daimler to test the hydrogen fueling stations uh, on these particulars in the uh, refueling station. And we have developed such a system, it's uh, our particle assembly adapter. And the particle assembly adapter is installed between um, the dispenser and the, the vehicle to be fulfilled. And during the refueling process, the um, hydrogen flows through a very thin membrane into this uh, particle assembly adapter. And this polymer membrane with a filter thinness of 5 mu um, removes all particles and uh, chemical uh, um, materials out of the hydrogen. It's only a test application. And after this test, uh, for vehicles, maybe not more than uh, five minutes, we remove this uh, membrane and um, analyze the membrane in our own uh, laboratories to, um, to give a feedback um, yeah, um, if the refueling station is suitable for uh, the refueling of the vehicles no? with a very pure uh, hydrogen, we call it a 5.0. Yes. And a wonder uh, the refueling station wasn't it. Um, there are a lot of initial uh, pollutions inside the refueling station because such a refueling station is manufactured, ma produced um, at a, a special machine manufacturer uh, facility. And on, based on this knowledge, we have developed a very wide um, portfolio on uh, filter and um, separation systems to remove um, all particles and uh, chemical materials out of the hydrogen. And step by step, um, in case of the refueling station, we have developed further um, technologies out or, or are based on our already existing know-how and technologies like um, cooling systems, um, sensor systems, um, complex wave systems, or hydraulic power units. Yeah. This is a very key um, factor in the whole equation of getting things on the road, fuel cells, uh, in, into transportation, into heavy duty. Um, uh, the fueling station themselves, I find it very interesting that the uh, demands on purity of hydrogen um, affect the lifespan of the hydrogen fuel cell. And if the lifespan of the hydrogen fuel cell is not long, the capital investment uh, in that vehicle with a hydrogen fuel cell is going to be prohibitively expensive. So this is part of the necessary success story. You need to get pure uh, hydrogen into that cell. Cell degradation is the term we used to use um, years ago, but it was from a different source. It was all the impurities from steam reforming of natural gas for hydrogen. Uh, we can talk about uh, you know where to get the hydrogen from, but for me it's very interesting to get back to this fueling station issue um, few people have discussed this in the detail that you have with me during the preparation. Um, there's something very peculiar about hydrogen and the way it performs. Um, and uh, you mentioned this once in, your, uh, in the, our prep talk. And I remembered it was something about a Joule Thompson effect. I didn't really write it down right away, so I forgot it. And I went around asking people uh, who do fueling stations, you know, what is this effect called? None of these geeks could tell me the correct name, so I had to get, go back to um, uh, HIDAC and ask your staff uh, there, you know, what is that effect called? And indeed, it is called the Joule Thompson effect. Um, and people talk about the negative Joule Thompson characteristics of hydrogen. Can you tell us a bit about this? Because it's amusing on the one hand. On the other hand, it highlights why when you fill up a propane tank, for your barbecue, you're dealing with an entirely different element. Uh, and it has entirely different characteristics. Uh, and this is why hydrogen poses entirely different challenges 
to fueling stations. So could you do the, uh, the, the, the math for us there? What is, what is so characteristic about hydrogen and why is it different from propane and natural gas? Yeah, one of the big challenges in the field of the refueling station is uh, refueling time. So you would like to have a speed uh, refueling process and uh, one critical factor is of course hydrogen because um, when you uh, refueling uh, hydrogen from 700 bar to an empty uh, tank in the vehicle with, I guess, 10, 10 bar, then uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the gas is uh, blowing out. And um, hydrogen um, has a behavior to the negative uh, Joule Thompson process. So it means when it's blow out, spread out, then the gas is getting very warm. So um, you have to cool down uh, hydrogen before refueling into the vehicle, cool down to till minus 40 degrees to avoid that the gas in the vehicle tank is getting too hot mm -hmm. and uh, the, the tank is then bursting uh, because of these um, um, high temperatures in the tank. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned yesterday, I'm not sure whether this is uh, vital, but uh, there, there is a, uh, a tolerance uh, level for these tanks. They don't like to be hotter than, how many degrees was that, roughly speaking? Approximately, some say 80 degree, some say 100 degrees, depending mm. on the tank itself. Yeah. Okay, that's a materials question as yeah. well. I often rush in to say, ladies and gentlemen, these tanks don't explode they vent <laughs> the myth that hydrogen is a dangerous um, uh, fuel to carry around has never been substantiated. We used to have people with tanks here and they would shoot rifles at them and make movies of it, trying to get them to explode, throwing them in fires. And it's a lot easier to get an explosion with a, uh, a conventional gas tank full of uh, conventional benzene gas. Um, but uh, it still raises the question, okay, so you have to deal with this at a fueling system. So there's two functions you're performing. One is filtration, and the other is uh, dealing with the characteristics of hydrogen. Does this affect the uh, economics of using hydrogen? Yes, of course, because uh, all these systems, uh, even the cooling system, needs a lot of energy uh, to proceed and, yeah, uh, energy, uh, it's, it's nowadays not cheap, no? Mm -hmm. And the more effective such a cooling system, um, it, then better it, uh, for the, the whole efficiency um, of the refueling uh, system. And yeah, efficiency, when we stay at this topic, um, over the, 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 the top in cooling, uh, nowadays already existing um, fuel cell projects in uh, heavy duty uh, applications. Uh, that's much more a uh, retrofitting um, application. So it means you take an already existing chassis with a, a diesel combustion engine, remove the engine and put a fuel set inside. And so it means you have to uh, handle with uh, the already existing space uh, on this chassis. And um, in the past, you, you had the luxury that 50% uh, of the uh, thermal energy uh, could be, can, can, can be blow out um, over the, um, <coughs> the, the, the stream. The, um, and this isn't, this isn't uh, possible in a fuel cell. So it means you have to go down uh, the fuel cell with a much more bigger, much more um, cooling performance um, cooling system so and you need more space for these cooling systems in your fuel cell application and space is very limited and we in very deep discussions with uh, our customers um, we have recognized this problem and therefore um, we have developed a, a cooling system we call it adiabatic cooling. Um, by this cooling system, we can use, reuse the process water out of um, the fuel cell and um, 
eat the water again back into cooler to um, blow um, the, the, the water over a very complex uh, nozzle system in the cooler itself and a very thin um, these very thin water particles are um, then um, vaporized and over this vaporization we can increase the whole um, cooling performance of this cooler enorm to realize um, the same cooling performance with less um, cooler space. Yeah. So it's all about fitting the application here, and that is my next question, actually. Um, uh, you're already uh, involved in the operation of uh, fueling stations on several locations. I'm not sure if you can name where, uh, but you probably have insider knowledge of what type of vehicles are the first consumers of hydrogen for mobile applications. Can you give us a roundup of what vehicles are uh, intensively using hydrogen right now? Most projects uh, um, with heavy duty um, applications with buses and something like this. Um, some uh, com uh, consumer vehicles um, are very relevant uh, in dis discussions and over the years, over the next years, also we have to think about uh, maritime, so ship um, applications. And but I think, especially in the ship applications, not only hydrogen will be um, a very relevant um, <clears throat> energy carrier, um, even more um, energy carriers like ammonia and methanol um, will be relevant too. And of course, um, refueling stations for these energy carriers have to be developed. And there are a lot of networks, um, even in the, in the north of uh, Germany. Uh, one is uh, Champfire, and out of this network, with a very wide um, company consortium, um, we are developing even uh, these refueling stations to enable um, mobile ship applications to be refilled uh, with methanol or ammonia as energy carrier. Okay, um, uh, we do have time for a question from the audience. If you do have a question, just raise your hand and I'll run over with the microphone. Um, uh, I certainly have another uh, a question or two. One is, um, again, when we were uh, preparing this talk, uh, you mentioned the Green Deal 2050 um, and where technology is going. If you put your visionary cap on, where do you see developments uh, midterm and long term uh, for your business as far as it relates to the hydrogen and fuel cell economy? What do you see coming? Um, we as HIDARC are convinced that we can't achieve um, the decarbonization of uh, all sectors um, with the focus of only one technology like battery or hydrogen. We're convinced that you have to use all existing or um, technologies which are developed in the future. And we have to use this. Um, so not only focus on a few cells at this, um, we have to think in um, hydrogen combustion engines. We have to use um, methanol dual fuel uh, combustion engine with uh, methanol and hydrogen because um, the strengths um, of all these energy carriers uh, can be used in different applications and uh, I'm sure um, each of these techno technology has its uh, particular strengths in um, several sectors. Well, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, it's been a pleasure, Dr. Dirk Birkland, uh, Business Development Hydrogen at HIDEC International. The booth is D41. I believe it's just over there. Yep. Um, and uh, most of the discussions go into far more detail when it gets to business. So join um, uh, Dirk there uh, for further conversations. I'd like to thank you for your participation. We hope to see you back here next year. Thank you, Brian. For <laughs> thank invitation. you.